you are watching COVID updates on Voice of Canada and this is Sana Harul. Alberta continues to lead Canada in active COVID-19 cases as unvaccinated people and the more contagious Delta variant continue to drive the surge of new infections. Inside Calgary's Peter Lougheed Centre, the intensive care unit is nearly completely full. I think the next few weeks are critical. You know, um, I would say I'm very concerned. Almost every COVID-19 patient admitted to this ICU is unvaccinated. Still, the sick keep coming. So if those cases continue to go up uh, and we don't see a crest in that, then you know we're going to see more and more patients needing critical care support. So yeah, it's very concerning. After weeks of silence, Alberta's government reintroduced a province-wide mask mandate Friday, along with a 10 o'clock curfew for liquor sales, but stopped short of implementing a vaccine passport system. Instead, the unvaccinated are now being offered $100 to get the vaccine. Alberta's former Chief Medical Officer of Health worries the measures don't go far enough. There's a doubt that the incentive program is going to convince many of the people who've been irresponsible up to this point to change their mind. And I think that uh, instituting masking indoors by itself is unlikely to be enough to bring the Delta variant under control. Alberta Health Services has had to cancel many non-urgent surgeries across the province. Nurses are in such short supply, the province has also had to turn to out-of-province staffing agencies to help. We need to have uh, some basic protective measures put in place. We need to make sure that the, that the spread of COVID-19 stops rapidly before we overwhelm our already um, near the brink healthcare system. One week into September, it's clear that Alberta's open summer is becoming a very difficult. Health officials with the World Health Organization, WHO say vaccine holding by developed countries is prolonging the pandemic. Just doesn't seem to get it. Uh, it really doesn't. Uh, it talks, the rhetoric is fine, it's all about sharing, it's all about fairness, but in reality, when push comes to shove and these products are available, they are hoarded in countries and they are not shared. We are seeing, uh, for example, dexamethasone and IL-6 inhibitors which modify the immune response uh, being used. Uh, dexamethasone is used widely, but IL-6 inhibitors are expensive. They, they, are very, they provide an additional benefit, but there are, again, no more than with the vaccines. There are a very small number of producers and most of those doses have been sold to the wealthy countries. And we're struggling to access doses of IL-6 inhibitors, I believe, Maria, that, that, uh, and that's, that's another inequity. Okay, it's not as glaring and it's not as obvious and it's not as public as the vaccine one, but once again, we repeat the same inequities. It doesn't matter at the large scale or at the small scale. But this is not just um, unfair, it's not just immoral, it's prolonging the pandemic and it is resulting in people dying. And I think we need to be blunt. I think we need to be very clear that this is prolonging the pandemic. We have tools, we have enough vaccine around the world. If we had used the vaccine doses that were available differently. Of the United States and through the fall season, the more contagious Delta coronavirus variant continues to surge there. For Americans, the long weekend brought packed beaches, crowded stadiums, and overflowing hospitals. And people are like, yeah, it's all open, it's all free, and it's devastating to me. Despite the widespread availability of vaccines, daily COVID cases and deaths in the U.S. have surged to levels not seen since January. Some states are seeing their worst days of the pandemic. In five states, less than 10% of ICU beds are available. There are um, no vaccinated COVID critically ill patients in these units. Among the hospitalized are a growing number of children, most still too young to be vaccinated. In places where school resumed in August, tens of thousands of students have contracted the virus, and hundreds of schools have already been forced to shut their doors. It all suggests a tough fall ahead as more students go back. What we're learning now is that the little kids who are under the age of 12, not old enough to be vaccinated, are often getting infected from unvaccinated adults and really in the school setting right in my opinion anyone over the age of 12 who goes into that school has to be vaccinated at the same time a resurging pandemic risks reinfecting the American economy job creation has slowed travel and tourism are once again dropping off 
while major companies like Google and Apple have scrapped return to work plans, pushing them to the spring of 2022. All of it adds urgency to the push for booster shots, which could begin to roll out to Americans later this month with FDA approval. We were hoping that we would get the, both the candidates, both products, Moderna and Pfizer, rolled out by the week of the 20th. Too late to save thousands of lives or quell the current surge. In just a few short weeks, the Delta variant has undone a summer's worth of optimism delivering a hard dose of reality for fall. Despite the Labor Day offering one last holiday for the summer, travel for the weekend is reportedly seeing a decrease due to the rise of COVID-19's highly contagious Delta variant throughout the United States. With over 7,600 Americans killed by COVID-19 last week, the Centers for Disease Control encouraged the unvaccinated to stay home this holiday weekend. But we still need your help to stop the spread of germs and viruses. The Transportation Security Administration reported a steep drop in air travel, the fewest screenings this week since late May. Many travelers are fearful of the Delta variant. Why wouldn't you be? It's, it's serious, it's more contagious than the last version. It's reason to be concerned. Several travel industry trackers are reporting a 10% drop in travel this weekend compared to 2019, including the Monaghan family who canceled their yearly trip to Disney World. We saw what was going on in Florida and how those numbers were getting high. We had our fingers crossed hoping it was just a spike, but those numbers never came down. Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama are among the nation's hotspots for new COVID-19 infections and deaths with some of the lowest vaccination rates. Over 38 percent of eligible Americans remain unvaccinated. Folks are seeing their loved ones get sick, get hospitalized and God forbid dying. Fears of the Delta variant come as almost every school in America is back in session next week, with hundreds of school districts still battling over mask mandates. This Arizona principal had her life threatened after telling students who had contact with a COVID-19 infected person to quarantine under county rules. Remember, Tucson is a small community and you have a target on your back. Many Republican governors are still banning mask mandates in schools, as new data from the American Academy of Pediatrics shows more than 20% of COVID-19 cases are now among children. A majority of Canadians continue to support mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations for workers who interact with the public. A new poll suggests as well as vaccination requirements for those returning to their offices. Almost three quarters of Canadians, or 74%, support mandatory vaccinations for people who work directly with the public, like transit and healthcare workers. 65% say businesses should implement mandatory vaccine plans in their reopening strategies. Canadians also showing concern about reopening the border with the United States. 66% believe that should have been delayed, compared to 18% who said they believe the border should have been opened earlier. And when asked about how to get the economy back on track coming out of the pandemic, the top priorities are lowering income taxes, addressing affordability issues, a universal basic income, and tax relief for small businesses. Our health uh, experts and out of uh, our political system over the last while about uh, about vaccinations has really penetrated uh, with public opinion. So anything that we ask about vaccines tends to have very high public lo levels of public support. So for example, in this instance, three quarters of the people that we interviewed, 74% uh, support mandatory vaccination for public facing workers. And that's just not healthcare workers or teachers. We're talking about um, you know transit workers, servers, grocery store clerks. People feel that one way to uh, make sure that they're protected uh, when, they when they deal with people who are, are facing them uh, in some of these occupations is that, uh, to make sure that they are vaccinated. But you take 25% of the Canadian population being on the other side of this and you multiply it by 38 million or maybe just reduce it to the number of adults that we have in the population. And that's still a lot of people, but that doesn't represent the vast majority of the Canadian population the 74 percent who actually believe that we should have mandatory vaccination for public facing. Well, I think, you know, in places like Atlantic Canada and Quebec, uh, first of all, in Quebec, there's a certain amount of controversy associated with, uh, uh, you know, for example, hacking in the, in, in the uh, passport system there. So if they get that straightened out, I think Quebec's numbers will rise as well. Atlantic Canada seems to be the part of the country that feels that it's got through this thing easier than, than, uh, than other parts of the country. So when it comes to uh, 
um, you know, moving beyond the way that they've been doing it, which is kind of the sealed Atlantic approach to uh, to managing the virus. Um, uh, you, you, you just you just don't see support levels as high. But in most of the country, we're talking about you know percentages over 60, and in British Columbia, 79 uh, percent supporting mandatory vaccination or, or passport uh, a passport system for vaccination. So um, you know, quite frankly, these are these are good numbers for people who are advocating for that. Yes, there's strong. Uh, views on the other side of this, but uh, the majority is with the people who are moving towards mandatory vaccination and passport systems. Uh, one of the things that uh, this election campaign started with was a real focus on drawing a difference between uh, the, the leaders, uh, particularly Aaron O'Toole and the rest of the leaders, uh, especially uh, Justin Trudeau and their approach to mandatory vaccination. Uh, but what you can see is that pretty consistently across the parties, uh, majorities do support mandatory vaccinations and we do support pass, pass, uh, passports for vaccination. Uh, so even conservative supporters, while they're lower than supporters for other parties on those questions, even majorities of conservative supporters think mandatory vaccination and, uh, and uh, vaccine passports. Quebec became the first province to put its vaccine passport system into practice. The passport are essentially certificates that confirm vaccinations and allow people to do things like eat out at restaurants, walk out at gyms, or attend live concerts. There is a new sound Quebecers are having to get used to, that little beep. Without it, there are going to be some serious limitations on what people can and can't do. Basically, before leaving home, you download the province's Vaxi Code app and enter your proof of vaccination if you want to do something like enjoy a cold one on a terrace. That's a patio for the rest of the country. I did it yesterday and it went really well. I thought it was going to be longer and it took a couple seconds and I was good to go. Very minimal. I think it took two minutes of my day. I opened my Vaxi Code. Now, Quebec is the first province, territory, or state in North America with a vaccine passport. Next. There's been an ad campaign for a couple of weeks, warning people to get ready. Beginning in September, you'll need a vaccination passport to enter certain public spaces. Don't wait until it hits you. Get vaccinated. The government has been predicting some hiccups with the rollout. The health minister said it could be, at first, in his words, rock and roll. The manager of this restaurant says he's been nervous for days, as it turns out, for nothing. So far, so good, I have to admit. Uh, one person didn't have it, so we decided to take a takeout instead, and it was really understandable. The VaxiCode app, or a printed proof of vaccination, is now required for places like gyms, movie theaters, bars, and restaurants. After a two-week grace period, fines could run up to $6,000. Not everyone is happy. When the pilot project was announced, opponents turned up outside the Quebec City restaurant where the app was being tested. There was also a protest in Montreal. We're supposed to have medical freedom in Canada, and it's difficult seeing. Uh, I know it's a choice that we make not to be vaccinated, but we used to be allowed to make that choice. Now, the vaccine code is not required for services like salons or driving schools, things the government deems essential. But there are appeals for that to change. This hairdresser says she will employ the app. You know, this tool is now available and I, I intend to use it. She says she'll ask customers who don't have it to go somewhere else. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. After months of refusing a provincial vaccine certification system, Ontario's premier says the fourth wave forced his hand. There's no secret that uh, you know, I wasn't in favor of this. Starting September 22nd, indoor settings like restaurants, bars, nightclubs, event spaces, and casinos will require... The venues that we have chosen are responsive to the risk that we've uh, found in Ontario. The vaccination won't be mandatory for workers at those businesses. Our membership, which is about 38,000 small and medium-sized businesses across Ontario, are extremely split on this issue. It's very contentious. Retail spaces, salons, banks, essential services and patios will not require proof of vaccination in Ontario. Those who are double dosed will be able to request a personal QR code on October 22nd. This can be stored on your phone or printed. Venues will scan the code along with checking a piece of ID like a driver's license or health card to gain entry. Ontario becomes the fifth province to release plans for vaccine passports, creating a growing patchwork of policies nationally. Had we had 
um, an opportunity to have a national certificate, we may have been able to establish some national protocols for response to the app going down, to the QR code not scanning correctly. Imagine traveling around, even Canada, with 13 different vaccination certificates. It would have been much easier if we had one passport, federal passport. So while it's not what Premier Ford had hoped for, like the fourth wave, the passport's here now. Questions continue to be raised about where Ontario Prime the fourth is as the province faces the fourth wave of COVID-19. Despite initial reports, a COVID-19 vaccine passport could be announced. It's the question being asked more and more. I want to know where the heck is Doug Ford? The Premier's been mostly out of sight since July 30th, except for a tour of Northern Ontario last week, where his schedule was not given in advance. The video later showed up on social media. Plans to reveal a vaccine passport or certificate have been delayed, even though it was supposed to come out today. And that's why we need the Premier to come out of hiding and act decisively. Cancelled, too, the weekly COVID-19 briefing by the province's chief medical officer, Kieran Moore. A health ministry statement said it was cancelled at Moore's request due to the government's ongoing work on a proof of vaccination certificate. Experts told us that we need a vaccine certificate now. But the Premier continues his delays and is dithering. The Premier is not on vacation. In fact, he's the star attraction at a PC party fundraising event tonight, along with three other cabinet ministers. Price of admission, $1,650 a person. But the location of that event, like other fundraisers in the last year, is a secret. Premier's office said we should ask the PC party for answers about the event, so we did and got no response. The Premier still hasn't answered any questions about the party's fake invoice fundraising scheme, telling past donors they owed hundreds of dollars when really they were just asking for a contribution. Earlier this month, the party's finance chair said this when we staked out the hallway at their offices. Will not happen again. I apologize to all my donors. And Who's losing their job or their contract Thank over this? These are internal matters. I'll talk to you later. But the leader of the party, Doug Ford, still isn't talking about that scandal or other issues. Keep watching COVID updates on Voice of Canada. For further updates, visit our website, voiceofcanada.tv.